Okay, guys, it's the first uh, Sunday in the month of March, which means we will be learning a new memory verse this month. You uh, probably uh, received one of these little postcards as you entered this morning. On one side of the postcard, there's information about our uh, Easter weekend, uh, time for our Good Friday service and for our Easter Sunday services. Uh, this postcard for that side should just be a reminder uh, that we want you and we hope that you are praying about uh, your friend or family member who doesn't have a church home, who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, uh, and that you will pray for them and invite them to one of our services on Easter weekend because we know this, people are often willing to come to church if a trusted friend or family member would invite them. So please uh, take this opportunity to invite that person to join us on Easter weekend. And then on the reverse side is our memory verse for the month of March. It's Romans chapter 5 verse 8. So I'm going to ask you right now to say it with me. Romans 5 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. Let's pray together. Father, we just sing Jesus, only Jesus. And as we sing that phrase, we're reminded of Jesus' ultimate act of love. His self-giving, his sacrificial love. While we were still sinners, while we were broken, while we were lost, while we were even your enemies, Christ died for us because that's how much you love us. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would fill this room with the love of Christ and let the love of Jesus touch a person today who feels alone, who feels misunderstood, who feels like they don't have a place, who isn't sure that anybody loves them. Touch them Holy Spirit, with the love of Christ and open their eyes um, to the wonderful fact that there's a God who created them and wants to have a relationship with them. We pray those things in Jesus' wonderful and his holy name. Amen. So guys, if you have your Bibles, let's turn together uh, to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. In just a moment, I'll be reading for us uh, verses 25 through 27. But before we read those verses together, I want to introduce you to a couple people. Yeah, first guy, yeah, that's Nemo. Does everybody know Nemo? Nemo's a fish. Uh, Specifically, Nemo's a clownfish. And then I need to introduce you to this guy. Uh, This is Don Vito. Don Vito's not a godfather. He's the godfather, right? Um... Now, I don't have to tell you, but here's the thing. Nemo and the Godfather have almost nothing in common. But they do agree on one thing. Family matters. It's the reason why when Nemo is separated from his dad, he spends the rest of the movie trying to find him. And it's the reason why Don Vito uh, cares for his family in his own unique way in all the Godfather movies. You know, family matters, and it matters in every stage of life. A baby needs a family's care and protection. A child needs a family's uh, guidance as they grow. A teenager needs a family's structure and support as they try to figure out their identity. An adult needs the feeling of love and connection that we find in a family. And a grandparent, they need a family because it gives them a sense of purpose and affirmation. 
I think we can all agree that family matters. But what all of us agree upon and what all of us need um, doesn't always line up with what we receive. Think about it. When we hear the word family, there are an array of emotions that people in this room experience. For some of you, when you hear the word family, you get a big smile on your face. Your family is like the Partridge family. Everyone in your family is so gifted, and when you get together, you make really beautiful music. You get a smile on your face because your family is like the Robinson family, the one shipwrecked on that island, right? You know, when bad things happen, your family just has this way of pulling together, uh, making the most of it, and you always find a way to overcome. Others of you, you, you know, hear the word family and you shake your head in embarrassment, right? Um, when you think of your family, you just know that your family's a little scary sometimes and maybe a little weird. You're like the Adams family, you know? Um, but if your family's like the Adams family, take heart. All of us have an Uncle Fester. Or maybe you hear that word family and you get a little uncomfortable. Yeah, um... A comedian once observed that the other night I ate at a really nice family restaurant. Every table had an argument going on. <laughs> Maybe you can identify with that. Or it could be uh, when you hear the word family, you have an altogether different reaction. Because you hear that word and it opens up the wound that has never healed. Uh, you cannot hear the word family without pairing it with a word like broken or dysfunctional or toxic. You know, if we're all being honest, we all know that family matters. Um, but no matter how great our family is, no matter how big the smile is on our face, listen, to a greater or lesser degree, none of our families have it all together. All of our families have issues, okay? Some families have lowercase i issues, some of it's a capital I issue, and others of us it's all caps, three exclamation points, issues. And the fact that there are issues in our family, it leaves each of us longing uh, for something more. We're longing for another family. And here's the good news. There is something more. You and I were created to be a part of a bigger family. You and I were, in fact, created to be a part of the very best family. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 puts it this way. That God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Yeah, you and I, we, people around the world, they, all of us were created to be a part of God's family. And God's family, listen, it's unique because it's cross-knit and close-knit. God's family's cross-knit. That's the reason it can be so big. God's family's close-knit. That's the reason why it's the best family around. And here's the thing. You and I, we, people around the world, can be a member of God's family. We can belong to God's family for one reason and one reason alone. Jesus Christ. And what Jesus did at his cross. Today we're continuing uh, this series we're calling Crosswords as we study Jesus' last words, the seven final statements that he made while he hung on a cross. And you guys are smart. You're above average intelligence. I didn't bury the lead this morning. Today's crossword is this word, family. And like we said earlier, family matters. Family is a fundamental human need. Because in families, we belong and we are known. And all of us were created 
to belong to and to be known by God's family. Now, to the doubters and the skeptics in the room, hear this on this morning. Family matters. Family matters for you. And by the end of this message, here's what I hope you understand. That in God's family, there is always room for one more around his table. There is always room for one more to take a seat on one of his couches. There's always room for you in God's family. You just have to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And to the friends and followers of Jesus this morning, hear me. Family matters. Yeah, that means... God's family is it's close-knit because in this family, you're going to feel cared for and supported and encouraged. It's a family with whom you can share uh, your greatest victories and accomplishments and a family that you can walk through the deepest valley with, that you can share with and tell about your greatest failures and fears. You see, family matters for all of us. And all of us were created to be in God's family. So to help us understand what it means to say that God's family is uh, cross-knit and close-knit, let's read together now from John chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. Here we go. Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to this disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, This disciple took her into his home. It's safe to say that crucifixion in the ancient world uh, was not family friendly. Uh, Crucifixion would have received a rating of NC-17, not suitable for children. But as John tells the story, there were some adults, um, some members of Jesus' own family who chose to watch this event unfold. One of those who chose to watch was his own mother, Mary. Have you ever wondered what Mary's reaction was? Standing close to the cross of her own son. Maybe Mary was in such shock at what she was seeing before her. That she couldn't move a muscle. No tears, no cries. She just was blown away with the horror in her eyes that she saw in her eyes. Or maybe Mary in that moment was like this volcano of inconsolable grief. Also, uh, an aunt of Jesus is at the scene. I wonder if she like puts her arm around Mary and tries to be her comfort, tries to support her at that hour. Or maybe that aunt, she um, tries to hide Mary's eyes from the most gruesome elements that she could see. Mary, Mary, look the other way. You don't want to watch that. You don't want to see that. You don't need to see that. We're also told that there are two other women at the cross Uh, Both of them named Mary. Uh, One of them is Mary, the wife of Clopas. Now, there's a tradition that Clopas was the actual brother of Joseph. Yeah. Jesus' earthly father. And that would mean that Mary, the wife of Clopas, was Jesus' aunt. We can't be sure that's the case, but here's what we do know about Mary, the wife of Clopas. Even if she's just a friend, she is not some sort of like, fair weather friend. The friend who fades in the background when the uh, situations get tough. No, Mary, the wife of Colfus, she's a faithful friend. 
She's a friend who sees you to the very end, who's with you in your worst of moments, in your toughest trials. She is a friend who's like family. There's also Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, you know her story? Jesus had cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene. And as Mary Magdalene watched Jesus gasp for air, I just have to wonder if she began to kind of replay the events of her life and maybe imagine what her life would have been like if she never met Jesus. And she's like, if I hadn't met him, imagine where I'd be. But because I met, I met him, look where I am. Jesus is not a member of Mary Magdalene's biological family, but I have to think she thought of Jesus as a member of her family, because why? Jesus never gave up on her. Other people did, other people wanted to push her aside, but Jesus took care of her in her hour of greatest need. We're also told there's someone else standing there. Um, John, the author of the gospel, John, he, he calls himself the disciple who Jesus loved. Now, that's not to say Jesus didn't love the other disciples. He did. Uh, that nickname just kind of speaks to the special relationship that existed between Jesus and John. And it also maybe tells us that John, uh, he, he believed like the most important thing about himself was that his identity was in Jesus. I'm loved by Jesus. I'm loved by Jesus. I'm loved by Jesus. And, and John, he goes to the cross because he wants to express his love for Jesus Christ. He wants to show the depths of how much he cares for him. You see, in John's eyes, Jesus is not just a friend or a best friend. He is more like a brother. Now, those bystanders, each of them could consider Jesus, in a way, a member of their family. But that doesn't mean that when they saw each other, they saw family. So that when these two guys were young adults uh, named Gary and Stephen, uh, they met each other. They're in their early 20s, and they became friends. And then soon enough, they were best friends. Uh, so much so that when one of them got married, the other was the best man in the wedding. So much so that a couple of years later, they have a photograph of uh, the two of them together. And one of them writes at the bottom of the photograph, we are truly brothers. He had no idea how... Uh, correct that he was in that moment. Yeah, they've been friends for 25 years, and then one day, a social worker calls. See, both of these guys have been adopted, and a social worker calls and connects the dots, and it turns out Gary and Stephen were actually brothers. Yeah. They had the same mom and the same dad. You know, when Jesus talks to his friends and his family. He speaks a word of revelation, just like that social worker spoke to Gary and Stephen. He, he speaks to his friends, who are his family, and he says, you are more than friends with one another, you are family to each other other, you are a part of God's cross-knit family. So Jesus, he, he lifts his head, he opens his eyes, and he sees his mom. And he says, dear woman, now, if I called my mom woman, 42 years old, she would have a problem with it, okay? But Jesus, he calls his mom woman for a very specific purpose. With that word woman, he um, creates relational distance between himself and Mary. Because Jesus, in that moment, he wants to take the focus away from Joseph's family tree and put the focus upon another family tree, God's family tree, God's cross-knit family. And so he says, uh, dear woman, he says, open your eyes and meet your son. And then he, he looks at John and he says, open your eyes, lift up your head, and meet your mom. And in that moment, God's cross-knit family is born. 
before that cross, Mary and John could be friends, but now because of the cross, they are family. And anyone, and I mean anyone, can be a member of this cross-knit family founded by Jesus Christ. Do you remember that show, Family Matters? Y'all remember that show? It was on TGIF ABC Friday nights. I was probably late elementary school, middle school when it was on the air. So for the younger folks in the crowd, it's like on Nick at Night now, okay? It's a classic. Um, Just as a reminder, the plot is something like this. There's a family named the Winslow family. They're kind of the central family in the story. Uh, in the show, but who steals the actual show is this uh, kid. He's junior high, high school age, and his name is Steve Urkel. Okay? Y'all remember Steve Urkel? Did I do that? That's Steve Urkel. So here's the thing about Steve Urkel. He's their neighbor, but he has this habit of every day showing up at the Winslow house uninvited and unannounced. Well, one day, uh, one of the Winslow kids looks at Steve Urkel. He's clearly annoyed with Steve. Steve had once again shown up uninvited, barged in on their family. And he's like, hey, Steve, why don't you ever knock? Steve Urkel looks at him and says, well, if I did, nobody would ever let me in. (laughs) Yeah, and like you, that studio audience roared with laughter. Um, But just stop and think about it for a second. That statement's kind of sad, isn't it? Nobody would let me in? Steve Urkel's crying out to belong to a family. He's looking for someone who will say, there's room for you at my table in my living room. In another episode, uh, Steve Urkel kind of makes a crack at himself. He says that one time I was playing hide-and-go-seek with my mom and dad. Apparently it was a long game of hide-and-seek because then he says, I didn't find them until I went to another city and I realized they were living under an assumed name. Yeah. Funny, isn't it? The studio audience laughs as well. But again, think about it. Steve Urkel expresses his own relationship with his own mom and dad as being kind of one of rejection, of being pushed away. Yet he still wants to belong. He still wants a seat at the table of the Winslow house. But he's just not sure there's going to be one. That's why Steve Urkel never knocks. He doesn't think anybody's ever going to let him in. So, I wish I could tell Steve Urkel that this family may not welcome you in. They may wish that you would, you know, give them a break, take a minute. But listen, I wish I could tell Steve Urkel God will always welcome you in. That God always has room for one more around his table. Yeah, it's true, Steve Urkel, you can belong. And the cross is the great equalizer in all of this. Because the cross brings together people of different backgrounds who the world, through the eyes of the world, say have zero things in common. The cross brings together people of different ages and different tax brackets and people who lived on different sides of the tracks. Uh, The cross brings together people who broke all of the rules and people who tried to play by the rules. The cross brings together people with all sorts of hurts and hang-ups and doubts and questions and fears. This cross-knit family... Listen, it's not a family for all, for just people who have it all together. Because the members of this cross-knit um, family, listen, we come from what we call like the as-is section of the store. Y'all know that section, right? Where it's just the bargain bin and things are missing buttons or they have a little stain 
or there's a little hole in them. Like, all of us are as is. We have imperfections and deficiencies and flaws, and God still says, you can belong to my family. There's a place for you in my family because it is cross-knit. It's by grace that you are welcomed into this family. And if you're a doubter or a skeptic in this room, hear this. God knows everything about you, and he still says there's a place for you. Nothing's hidden from his eye. Yet he still says there's at least a seat for one more because it's cross-knit. God's family also is close-knit. Did you notice at the end of that passage, John, we're told, he welcomes Mary into his home because they're going to be close-knit, right? They're going to be in it together. They're going to take care of one another. He's going to make sure she's looked after. In the early church, they took that to heart. Check out Acts 2. Acts 2, 44 through 46, that all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Isn't that a description of a close-knit family? They meet together, they care for each other, they serve one another. So if you're a friend or follower of Jesus this morning, I've got a question for you. Listen, you've put your faith in Jesus Christ already, so you are a member of God's cross-knit family, okay? But do you contribute to this church this local expression of God's family being close-knit. Or maybe um, we answer that question by asking these three questions. Do I show up? Do I show up? So Sundays and Wednesdays, when we come together, you're not attending a conference, okay? You're not attending a rally. Anytime God's family gets together, it's like a family meal. It's like a family reunion. That means we've got Uncle Fester's in our midst. It's okay. All right? And by singing together and praying with one another and reading God's word together and fellowshipping on Wednesday nights around the table together, um, The Holy Spirit does something miraculous, something we can't do on our own. He binds us together as a close-knit family. But you got to show up. But don't just show up for worship and go home. Show up for connect group. Join a connect group for some of you. Show up for Connect Group Fellowship. Show up and participate in Connect Group Ministry Opportunities because those are the opportunities that God uses in our life when we show up, the Holy Spirit makes us close-knit because we get to know each other. Another question we got to answer is just the question, do I care? Do I care? You know, during the week... Do you check in on someone from our church family? It could just be like a quick text message, a little phone call. It doesn't have to be an hour-long lunch. I get that. Like, sometimes your lunches are always booked. Your mornings are always booked. But could you send a text or make a call? Or when you find out someone needs prayer and you say, I'm going to pray for you, do you actually pray for them? That's a sign of caring about that person. Final question is this. Do I serve? Serving is so important because it first redirects our focus to Jesus Christ. And when we serve, we see and we're reminded that Jesus is the greatest of servants, the ultimate servant. And we're just reminded in that moment, our family is first and foremost, it is cross-knit. 
And second, um, serving, right, is a way that we care for other people. And listen, when we care for other people, that requires us to um, be in tune with and learn what is going on in other people's lives. Good, bad, and ugly. Someone may not even want to share it with you, but you get a picture from the outside looking in by just being present in the moment. And when you know what's going on in somebody's life, when they welcome you in, you can't help but become closer to them. Serving. You listen, we don't serve. When we serve, we don't serve in isolation from people either. Um, typically, we're either serving with someone or for the benefit of someone else. And the people we serve alongside, man, the Holy Spirit does something magical and miraculous in that moment, bringing us together. And again, when we are serving on the, on the benefit and for the good of somebody else, we are aware of what's going on in their life, and we want to pray for them. We want to care about them. So how did you do? Oh, for three? One for three? Two for three? Maybe three for three. Listen, gang. If you belong to this cross-knit family that we call uh, First Baptist Church of Hot Springs, it's on each of us to do our part so that we are a close-knit family. A bird has a flock, uh, a bee has a colony, and a cow has a herd. And a fish, like Nemo, they've got a school. The natural world proves for us that family matters. And if family matters for animals, it matters for insects, how much more does family matter for you and for me? It matters all the more for you and me because we were created to belong to God's family. His cross-knit and close-knit family. And here's what I want you to know. Here's what you have to remember. In God's family, there's always room for one more. And then one more, and then one more, and then one more. There's never a wait list at God's table. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the way that you are working in this room, the way your Holy Spirit is present. And I pray for that person now who isn't a part of your family. And I just pray they would under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, realize they were created to belong to your family. There's something in their life that will forever be missing until they put their faith in Jesus Christ and take their seat at your table in your living room. Holy Spirit, do a work that only you can do. And I just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would continue to bind together this, um, this church family, that we would be close-knit. We're going to do our part, and then we're going to leave the miraculous up to you. <laughs> we're going to be willing to show up and to care and to serve, and we're going to leave the binding together of our lives up to you, and we know that you will be the cord that brings us together. And God, I just say thank you that there was always room for one more at your table. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We're gonna sing just one more song together today. This is a time when we respond uh, to what the Holy Spirit is saying to each and every one of us.
in a couple ways um, that the Holy Spirit may be asking you to respond this morning is to um, knock on the door, put your faith in Jesus Christ, trust Him as your Lord and Savior, and take your seat around God's table in His family. Or another way God could be moving in your life uh, this morning is you've been visiting for weeks, if not months, maybe even years, and you like been dipping your toe in the water, but you realize I need to be a part of a family, a close-knit family who can support me and encourage me and be with me through the ups and downs of life. We invite you, if you want to put your faith in Jesus Christ, to come forward this morning. We invite you this morning, if you want to join this family of faith, to please come forward. But know this, no matter where you are on your journey of faith, God is speaking to you. I just pray that you would listen to his voice and yield to his direction. Let's stand together now and sing.